One of the fundamental skills required in chess is the ability to count how many times a piece is being attacked or defended. And that can be either your opponent's piece or your own piece. Or typically, as a game develops, it will be both pieces. So with that in mind, I've set up a position where we don't know which side it is to move. But we can see that if it's wide to move, black doesn't have any real problems because only one of his two pieces, the bishop here on c7, is being attacked. It's being attacked once by rook and defended once by black's rook. So therefore, because the bishop is of lower value than the rook, there is no danger for black in this position if it is white to move. However, let us imagine a situation where it's black to move. So here we see that the white knight is defended only once, but is attacked twice by the rook on f7 and the bishop on c7. So therefore, such a position would just spell disaster for white if it were black to move. Every experienced chess player has a very well-refined ability to quickly spot how many times any of his pieces are being attacked and how many times he is attacking any of his opponent's pieces. And then even spot tactics that build on this fact. So let's imagine in this position, move the black king. Let's pretend it's white to play and let's move the king over one square. So let's do that now. So here in this position, an experienced player would notice that the king and the bishop can be forked by the knight. And so at this minute, the rook on c4 is the only piece that attacks the bishop, and the rook on f7 is the only piece that defends. White knows that if he can bring another piece to attack that bishop, it will be possible to capture it. So in fact, the move knight to e6 check would just win the game for white on the spot. Let's take a look at another example. This position right here is taken from a high-level Grandmaster game. And what we notice about the count is that both white and black have a piece that is attacked and defended an equal number of times. So the knight on c6, that's attacked once by the rook on c1 and defended once by the bishop on b7. Similarly, we can see that the knight on d5 is attacked once and defended once. However, in this situation, it is white that has a very concrete threat, and it's similar to the previous example that we saw. Let's say that black played a silly move like pawn to b5. White would actually capture the knight on c6. And the point is that after bishop takes, well, white now has the move knight to e7 check with a fork and a discovered attack on this bishop on c6. So you can see it's very, very possible, and in fact, it happens all the time, that you take advantage of these pieces that are not defended quite so well, right? There is a principle in chess of overprotecting uh, certain points in your position, and uh, part of the value behind overprotection is that you prevent these kind of tactical shots. In the game itself, Black actually saw this and played the move king to h8, so he stepped away. But the problem was that White had a nasty tactic in store. He played knight takes b6. And the idea of this move is, well, we see this pawn on b6. We can see that this pawn is defended once and only attacked once. So we have a level score in that regard. But of course, a pawn being worth much less than a piece, white under normal circumstances should not be able to capture. The reason why he can in this position is because after pawn takes b6, we see that the bishop on e4 is now attacking the knight. The whole point behind white's play is to simply clear the path for the e4 bishop and add an attacker to the knight on c6. None of this would have been possible 
if White wasn't keenly aware of the count of attackers and defenders. So the important takeaway is that you become very comfortable counting pieces, either your pieces that are being attacked or your opponent's pieces that you are attacking. And initially, it may take a little while before you feel comfortable even with simple situations. But over time, you can feel comfortable counting even in very complex situations. So for example, let me just post one final example taken from this very game, but just an earlier position in the game. So let's do that here. So here is the position in question. And we can see how the count is a lot more complicated now. It's white to move, and white can capture this pawn. And we see that he's attacking that pawn once, twice, three times. That's defended once, twice. So he can actually win that pawn. But on the other hand, if we look at this knight on e5, that is attacked three times and only defended once. So, of course, it's not so easy to calculate the consequences of a move like pawn takes d5. In fact, in the game, that's what was played. And here, black had a choice of knight takes knight or pawn takes pawn. And he tried pawn takes pawn, but subsequent analysis showed that perhaps he went wrong and it would have been better to capture the knight. So that's an example of even, you know, really high level grandmasters going astray in the complications. So that's it for this section. It's a pretty basic concept overall, but it can increase in complexity to reach positions like these ones where even strong grandmasters aren't quite sure what the best path is. And there can be no doubt about one thing, which is that if you are not comfortable counting and being very, very quickly aware of these dangers that may lie for you or for your opponent, then all the strategy in the world isn't going to help you because you are simply going to miss when your opponent blunders a piece or when you have a nice tactical shot to win material or you will just drop pieces left, right and center yourself. So on that note, we will now move on to the topic of unprotected pieces, which is closely related, of course.